Oh. Oh, weird. We're good. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, the siren's not on, so that's good. All right. Yeah. So we were talking about how to make films with these, this continuum that's been developing over time between the work that you would call the kind of clear genre-based work when you go on Netflix, the dramas, the comedies, right. your horror films. And then you have your quintessential art house work or the more ambiguous pieces, the things that you can't really describe with one name, right? right? And I would actually position like Shakespeare in that, even though right. he had comedies and tragedies, they were usually a little bit of both, right? right? So how do I today as an artist, as a filmmaker, as someone who wants people to see my films, but also wants to make things that have some personal meaning to me, how do I make good work? Mm -hmm. And I think what I want to do is to be somewhere right in the middle. Right. How do I get you to to feel the genre and to come in with the genre and to accept me as a genre right. but then to leave the film in a completely surprised artistically ambiguous state right. which is that state of sort of the sublime yeah. the kind of quintessential artistic experience the ineffable thing and but the ineffable thing you don't want to say when you start a date you know you don't want to right. say that on the first date you want to say that your okay cupid, cupid profile shouldn't say i am you know a complex multifaceted person that usually is a very confusing thing for someone yeah. you usually say i like to go you know walk on beaches and you, i like movies right. and that's how you relate and so that's what the genre does it's a relatable space for people right. to come in right. and if they want to go see a western they'll go and see western right. and they'll leave and they'll go oh my god i came out of jangle and chain not realizing that that wasn't really a western right. that was something else completely right. but it got me on the fact that it was a western right. and so it's the hook it's the chorus to the song gotcha. yeah. so what do you say to or about people who uh, occupy the film world on either side of you the people who are all genre and people who are no genre I would say I've loved everything from all of those things yeah. I've loved hyper commercial genre things because I can see in a, there's a filmmaker Louis Bunuel who has a great line about this he said even in the worst film there are at least five minutes of good filmmaking hmm. and so for me as a craftsman I see even in like the recent Star Wars film, a film that I thought was fine, it was a very commercial film, it served a purpose for its audience. Mm -hmm. There's a good craftsmanship in there, in places. Right. Right. Did I like the film? No, not my right. cup of tea, but I could tell, oh, that's a really good, and I'm stealing things, I'm like, oh, that's a good scene, and right. that was well done, that was well choreographed. And right. so there are, there, and, and so I think that there's a huge, today I think we especially now, because we live in a world where geekdom has become chic where fanboys have become the new artists, they become the ones that are the ones that are given the, the tickets to, the Willy Wonka tickets to work with Disney and all these right. things. You have a certain class system now of the jocular geek filmmaker and you have the more kind of uh, what people call the pretentious art house filmmaker type, the one who's trying to kind of, who uses sobriety as a way to kind of distance himself from what are considered lesser forms. I happen to like a lot of those things. I happen right. to like the things that Art House offers. I happen to love some of the stuff that genre offers. Right. And I happen to think that, to me, good art, because I do feel I'm an artist working in film, good art, I think anyone can experience and, and take something from that experience. They may not be able to articulate it, and that has to do with their own language and their own abilities to understand the language of the work. But they should be able to experience it and come away from it. And so I think that, that's where I see myself, yeah. Do you have any sense of the general uh, drift in our culture towards genre? Towards uh, yeah, genres? yeah. I think there's a, there's a big drift, and I think the drift has a lot more to do with class. I think the drift has to do with where you went to school, um, who you hung out with in school, has to do with what your parents did in terms of, you know, were they, you know, whether the guys who were marching on Washington, were they liberal arts educated, did your parents go to UC Berkeley, that kind of thing. And so you get an academies culture that's raised in academia that tends to look analytically and critically minded at things. And, and critical mindedness becomes a form of uh, jocular exercise. Mm. And so we sort of take merit and we praise people who think critically. Mm. And we praise people who, who disavow in a kind of monastic way these the kind of tr trivial pleasures of genre. Mm. Violence and sex usually are the first two, sex really. Right. Now I like sex, I like fucking, I like watching people <laughs> fuck. I'm a voyeur, I love right. that stuff. Right. And I think that you know, one of my favorite filmmakers, Nagisa Oshima, a Japanese filmmaker, highly political filmmaker, he also made a film called The In the Realm of the Senses, which was a very, very, very uncensored, unsimulated sexual film. That was also a beautiful genre, a love story, a romance. Mm. Go, go figure. And so I like things like that, but I think there is a gulf that's happening right now where you also have the people who I think 
part of this has to do with a insecurity around what we call intellectualism mm -hmm. and insecurity around things that seem smarter than they are. I love things that seem smarter than me, mm. you know, and that can challenge me to think harder about it. Mm. But I also like to have fun. And so those two seem to be competing things that we, can, we tend to want to keep separate. Right. But I tend to feel, and I feel this in my own work and the work that I love, I like work that forces you to think and enjoy the thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you can do both. Yeah. I think that's hard. That's really yeah. hard work. But yeah. it's very rewarding because I also feel like it's more rigorous, it's more robust. I can watch it again and get more out of it. Mm -hmm. I can watch it 20 years later and it doesn't feel dated, right. which happens a lot with both of the things that are you know, topical based, both yeah. genre and art house. Right. So I do think that there's a gulf. On one side you have people who are looking for films as a purely escapist joy, as a way to turn off their brain, as they call it, which is impossible without dying. But, mm. you know, but it's a more metaphorical mm. thing. You know, I want to turn off, I don't want to think about my anxieties or my woes. Mm. And then there's other people who are like, I want things to make me feel bad. Right. right. <laughs> you know, which is, to me, just as valid an experience as I want things to make me feel good. Right. I think those are the cinema as a tool. But you want to be in the middle. I want to be able to do whatever I, I feel like as an artist I have the right to be able to use all of those things. Right. I'm more interested in the plurality of that. How can you feel right. bad and good at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's to me the space of art. It's an oscillation yeah. where you feel, and that's sort of the, the quintessential feeling of irony. An ironic experience is usually yeah. two feelings at once. Yeah. So to me good art is that. Good art is that plurality, that duality of experience. And I'm using pretty ac academic words, but I think to me it's that amb ambiguity yeah. that works. And the kind of complexity. Yeah, where well, you can it's, see both yeah, screens. Yeah, yeah. It's just to me, it becomes more real. It becomes true to life. Right. You know, and it can be a space opera. It can be right. a fantasy. But if it's true to life, yeah. I can't pinpoint. And there's a tendency, and I think this happens also in the script writing class, where you have a happy scene, you have a sad scene, you have the scary scene, you have the challenging scene, you have the resolution scene, and they tend to be pretty separate in terms of their emotional mm -hmm. arcs. They mm -hmm. tend, you don't really have the scary thing with the happy thing at the same time. Right. That's a conflict. Of, that's a conflict yeah. of emotion. It's not clear, and so. But I like that unclarity. You I, know. I do yeah. too. Are we better at that complexity than we used to be? And I if we're, we're better, what would what? How did we get from Ooh, from that good, notion yeah. of popular culture as yeah. being sort of a dumbing down exercise? Yeah, yeah. Somehow our culture it feels like the Netflix work yeah. says, "Shit, people are good at complexity." Yeah, they and like it. The question it. is, how yeah. do they get better? I think you get better at, at complexity through uh, continued experience, right. through pushing yourself into things that you may not necessarily like at first and to leaning into that discomfort. Mm. Complex things are uncomfortable, they give you a headache, you usually want to walk it off, mm. you usually want to go masturbate or sleep. You know, mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that make you want to eat a burger and right. just not think about it. Right. And those are things that are really human experiences right. to be able to push yourself further into that. So right. the more we can watch films like Tarkovsky movies that seem so bloated and portentous, right. but when you watch it in a movie theater enough times, yeah. it makes total sense. Yeah. On some level, you can't explain it. But I think that deals with exposure, that deals with lowering the barriers to entry on right. the commercial side. Right. You know, making Tarkovsky seem hip. Yeah. How do you make Tarkovsky hip? Yeah. I think that has to do with how we market our films today. Right. You know, there are great films that nobody sees and there are terrible films that everyone sees. Right. And it has a lot to do with the distribution budget, which no one talks about. When you see an opening gross weekend of a movie, right. you see their production budget and you see how much money it made that weekend. Production budget is usually a fraction of the cost of the film. Right. The cost of uh, uh, Spectre, the new Bond film, was $250 million. The cost of Star Wars was $200 million. The production budget were those two. The distribution budget for Bondage, or for, sorry, for uh, um, Spectre was, I think, $450 million to distribute the film. Mm. That's why everyone saw that movie. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can get challenging work to have that kind of distribution budget, mm. and these things are getting more challenging. Spectre had some ideas it wanted to work with, right. but I think there's a tendency when, and this is a no-risk situation that happens in Hollywood, right. where you need films to make a return. Spectre is produced by, what was it? It's an MGM, I think Sony Pictures Classics was involved, and there's a, you know, there's, these are big companies whose, they're subsidiaries of larger corporations that have quarterlies, and they sell TVs, they sell products. So right. this money they've allotted towards this product, the film, needs to be returned in a right. quick amount of time. And you so, could argue, what do you say to the argument that says, well, there's a kind of rough democracy at work here, uh -huh. people don't want to invest Disney doesn't want to invest in projects that won't find a big market, yeah. and that ensures that the filmmaker is working to, to a genre right. and yeah. trying to keep it broad and trying to keep it clear. Yeah. Well, to me, I think that has to do with it has to do with an, it's kind of reminds me of No Child Left Behind, 
the right? school system. Yeah, yeah. I, my little brother was in that system, and it was pretty brutal mm -hmm. and not very effective. And I mm -hmm. think it was once effective for a very key reason. Individuals learn. Mm -hmm. Groups of people don't learn. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Groups of people don't think. We have this vague notion of groupthink and hive-mindedness. But when a person has an artistic experience, it's an individual catharsis. It's an individual experience. Mm -hmm. And that also happens in an entertaining experience. Right. When you have a good time. So I think that I, un I understand totally why someone like Disney or a company like these would actually want to broaden and to dumb down, quote-unquote. Or I think, I think the, a better way of looking at it is to, in their mind, they're seeing it as clarifying the complexity right. that they're working with. Right. But the minute you clear, there is, a, there is a fine line which I think the adjudicator has to be the artist, in this case the director or the writer, right. has to be the adjudicator to really determine is this too clear. Right. And that has to do, I think, and this is the problem I think with a lot of film today, I don't mind clarity, but I like clarity when it's the clarity that is in a different language than spoken. We live in a very verbal culture mm -hmm. where we like to reason out through words our ideologies, our politics, our social interests, mm -hmm. and it's become a big part of today's culture. Right. But in life, there are a lot of, especially in cinema, as cinema interprets life, mm -hmm. it interprets life through pictures. Mm -hmm. And there are ways that pictures can tell you things that words can't. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage filmmakers, encourage studios to think in ways to subtly, through pictures, mm. be clear about what they're trying to say without having the, the right. character need to preach. Right. Because yeah. the minute someone is in a movie theater, keep in mind the space you're in, you're sitting right. in a movie theater, you're looking up at someone, they're yeah. preaching. Yeah. The minute they start talking, yeah. you've ever seen one of those movies, you know when it happens, they start preaching the moral of the film. And, and worst case, you get the uh, 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 doctor exposition comes and explains yes. what's right. happening. Explain what, yeah, yeah, because we need to know. <laughs> it's that great scene in Inception I thought was so funny. You know, it's a film that's a very clunky film with a great idea. The best parts of the film are the films where no one's talking. Right. You know, where they're not explaining right. it. Just show me. I'll figure right. it out. Yeah. You know, trust me. Yeah. And I think that's the big can, difference. Can we trust viewers more than we used to be? Oh, to yes. I think and we can. Yeah. I think that? we can because I think, you know, we live in a culture now where kids are being raised on iPads. And so we, visual culture, the language of editing, which is the key language of cinema, it's a photograph that cuts to another photograph. Right. That is movie making at its right. pure essence. Right. The absence of everything else, you'll still be watching a movie. If you see yeah. a moving picture next to a moving picture next to a moving picture, yeah. composition on composition on composition, yeah. that's movie making. And yeah. so if you, can, if you can use that language, understanding that children are now being raised on that, yeah. they know that language before they know how to read or write. Yeah. They know how to read a movie. They know how to watch a movie from the, like, from the one they can watch yeah. a movie. And they get it. They yeah. get it. They yeah. get the experience. Yeah. So if you can I, do I recently did a calculation, you know, Melvin Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to get yes. good at something. Right, right. So thought, when did we watch 10 hours, 1,000 hours, hours of film, TV? Yeah. <laughs> By the time we're eight. Oh wow, that's By hilarious. By the time we're 27, uh, we watched 30,000 hours of Oh TV. my God, I probably watched 100,000. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's Anyhow, so sorry. funny. No, that's yeah. a good observation because it makes a lot of sense. There's an abundance of media and it's not just the movies we're watching, it's everything is catered, advertising is so catered towards you know, this kind of medium yeah. and the language of editing. Yeah. And so because we know that grammar, it's in us, it's yeah. an instinctual grammar. So what do you say to the art house people who say, dude, anytime you resort to anything that's obvious or genre or yeah. clear, you're betraying an art your artistic obligation to, I mean some, yeah, I yeah, guess yeah, people yeah, insist, yeah. right? Your job is, is, is to refuse Defy them. and yeah, and yeah. I I think that I would point them to people like the Coen brothers and to filmmakers who are able to use mystery to their advantage right. and to get you to lean into. There's a difference between, I think, being vague and being ambiguous. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Good art can be very ambiguous, but yeah. you don't want it to be vague. Right. Because if it's vague, it means you're not, you're not, you know, we don't yeah. know why we're here yet. Yeah. You know, and I think that has to do with the entrance, yeah. the entrance to a thing. And I think having something presented in a clear manner about elucidating a complex idea right. is incredibly powerful and immersive. Yeah. And, and I think this has to do a lot with our pattern-seeking brains at, at, yes. the, at the core. We <laughs> seek patterns, we, we know, and this is sort of, to me, I think that kind of uh, um, refusal to clarity reminds me of the Terrence Malick logic, yeah. that kind of filmmaking, where it's sort of, I'm gonna wobble the camera because I'm irritated <laughs> with stationary you know, right. filmmaking. Right. And it's like, okay, sure, I don't understand why, I don't right. know why this is happening. It's, it's rule-breaking for its own sake. For its own sake. Yeah, and I yeah. think uh, Soderbergh said that really well. He tried to experiment without attaching his camera to a to a a, a, a fan blade. Right. You know, like right. there's a point where it becomes <laughs> just narcissistic, and right. you're just doing it because it's fucking cool. And like right. I don't, you know, to me, I feel like that's a great exercise for you to learn as a filmmaker. Right. But I'm not here to watch you learn. I right. think it's a big difference with art between a lot of art house filmmakers' logic. 
they're more interested in their internal process of making the film. And you get this a lot with actors. It's kind of funny. This happens a lot when you're working with a lot of actors. Right. They're so much more interested in their internal process. They're right. not as interested in what the audience is seeing right. and watching. And to me, as a director, my job is to sit in that movie theater yeah. in my head while I'm making a film and go, what am I seeing? Yeah. What is this cutting to? Yeah. You know, what's next? What's yeah. before this? Yeah. What did I just do before this? You yeah. know, what's happening? And so that to me is the logic that I think makes art sing, makes narrative art sing. If you don't want to yeah. make narrative art, then just abandon that story altogether, please. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, because sure. a minute, I would say the warning I would put is a minute you put a story in, the, in your film, in any way, right. you're going to heighten your expectations for your audience to a tremendous degree. And so if you want to use that, use that, but understand that your audience is going to come in expecting a lot more from you the minute you acknowledge a narrative in some way. Right, yeah. right. You were talking about patterns uh, yeah, and yeah. pattern recognition. Do patterns have to be less patterned? I think patterns, so this is sort of the way I think, you know, so Arthur C. Clarke was really into fractals. He had a really obsessive, childlike obsession with fractals. 